Well, it's great to be with you again this morning, family. I'm excited to get in the Word of God with you. We are continuing today in our series in the book of Daniel. And so I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, or if you'd like to follow along on your phone, the digital Bible, whatever works for you. It's been a great study so far. Last week, Pastor Cynthia did an amazing job teaching us out of chapter 6, the very famous story of Daniel and the lion's den. And if you missed that message or any of the messages in this series, you can always catch up with those on our YouTube channel, The Bridge Foursquare Church. And you can see any of those within our Daniel series or before that, and we were in the book of Psalms. And throughout the course of this year, we've been putting our recorded services on our YouTube channel. Well, again, last week, Pastor Cynthia taught out of chapter 6, and I'm going to actually begin our study today with the last verse there, or verse 28, rather, of Daniel chapter 6, because it kind of sets the tone for where we're moving forward today. Daniel 6, 28 says, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And I want to just kind of help us turn the page a little bit today. Because that verse and the end of chapter 6 really ends the biblical account or the narrative of Daniel's life in the way that we've been following it for six chapters. This really kind of concludes that historic narrative. And we don't know how Daniel died or where he was buried But for all intents and purposes, at least in understanding the historical journey of Daniel's life, that ended at the end of chapter 6. So you might be thinking to yourself, Pastor B, if if, if that's the end of Daniel's life, then what what are we supposed to do with the rest of this book? Well, I'm glad you asked. And today we're moving in a little bit of a new direction. And let me just remind you of what I shared with you as we began our series in Daniel, is that it really is divided into two sections. The first six chapters of Daniel, again, are the historical narrative of Daniel, of his three friends, right, of the exile in in Babylon. It's a, a period of history of about 65 years from the time that we're first introduced to Daniel until the end of chapter 6. And how many have enjoyed that so far? Just an amazing uh, lessons of faith and courage and resolve, amen, of what it means to live counterculture in the midst of, of difficult times. I don't think that there could have been a more pertinent study for us as a church family. Well, chapters 7 through 12 are now going to shift into biblical prophecy. And we're going to be looking future. We're going to be looking forward in these next chapters. Chapters 7 through 12 are actually Daniel's prophetic journal. So these are a a journal of dreams and visions that God gave to Daniel. They're kind of an addendum to the first six chapters. These are things that have not been fulfilled even yet in our lifetime. Things that are yet to happen. Many have referred to the book of Daniel as the the Old Testament revelation or the little book of revelation. And I think that we're going to find, especially as we begin to venture into these last chapters in this book, that, that actually the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel are companion books that they really do uh, feed off of one another and build off of one another. In fact, I think we're going to see today that there are elements of what we're going to study in chapter 7 of Daniel that would not be clear to us if it weren't for being able to see a companion study in the book of Revelation. So they're going to work together to bring revelation and insight to our lives. So this prophetic journal are dreams and visions that Daniel received really during the time of the first six chapters that we just read through. Does that make sense? So these aren't things that, these aren't dreams and visions that happened at the end of Daniel's life. This is a journal of dreams and visions that God gave him through the course of his life, at least those 65 years that we studied through the first six chapters. Let me give you an example of that. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. If you're ready, say ready. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, dot, dot, dot. We'll stop there. So we know that Belshazzar was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. You guys remember the study there that we had, right? In chapter 5, and Belshazzar was throwing this 
dinner party, so to speak. It was way more carnal than that. But, and, and we know that that was really the end. That night was the end of the Babylonian reign. So you see then that, that this dream, this vision that we're going to study today in chapter 7 is actually one that Daniel had probably 13 to 15 years earlier right, at the time of King Belshazzar. So again, these chapters are attached as a journal and are biblical prophecies of things yet to happen. The dreams and visions that God gives Daniel in chapters 7 through 12 are really intense. In fact, they are so intense and dramatic that we will read on a few occasions where Daniel becomes physically ill in, because of the things that he sees. In Daniel 8, verse 27, Daniel says, I, Daniel, was worn out and lay exhausted for days. That same passage in the New King James Version reads, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business, and I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. I sincerely hope that none of you get sick listening to my sermon today. At least not any more than you usually do when you sit through one of my teachings. I pray for the best of that. <laughs> so these dreams that we're going to read about, especially here in 7 and 8, are going to describe some future events for the world. And I want to just give a, a little bit of a, a precursor to our study today. And I don't say this to um, take away at all from any of the sense of responsibility or accuracy with which Myself and our team are going to be preaching and leading us through the second half of the book of Daniel. But the reality is that the most brilliant Bible scholars throughout history have died arguing over their interpretation of end times prophecy. And so what we see is that there are, are ways and different ways in which people have seen and interpreted and understood these passages of Scripture. And in fact, as a result of that, there has been great debate and confusion, even division within the church. And you know my heart. That's not our goal. That's not our goal. My prayer for us as a church family is as we study these very intense, sometimes confusing, yet important themes that we will first and foremost see God in his word. I said to you from the very beginning of this study that this is not just a, a book about Daniel, but this is really most importantly a book about Daniel's God, about your God, about my God. And I, I pray that our hearts would be stirred, family, even compelled to serve God faithfully and to courageously and lovingly bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings freedom to those who are captive. Amen? And that we would be excited and inspired to bring this message of the gospel to the world around us. Amen? All right, here we go. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. And Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked. And there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion. And it had the wings of an eagle. And I watched until its wings were torn off. And it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. And after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying, frightening, and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had 
ten horns. And while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. Three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Another translation says a mouth that spoke blasphemies. So if you've been with us so far in our study in the book of Daniel, you're probably already kind of tracking with this vision of these four beasts. And what you might remember is that they actually fall in an identical pattern to the dream that God gave King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 of the great statue. How many by a show of hands remember that study in Daniel chapter 2? Right. So we remember this statue was a dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar about ultimately the, the, the decline of, or overthrow of his empire and subsequent empires that would come throughout history. Scholars affirm that correlation, and they attribute these identities to these four beasts that we just looked at today in Daniel chapter 7. The first one that Daniel saw was the lion, and the lion represents the kingdom of Babylon, and that was the kingdom under King Nebuchadnezzar. The wings of an eagle speaks to Babylon's power at one time. It was the greatest empire on, on the planet Earth, but... Its power was taken like the wings that were plucked from the lion. It was defeated and it was relegated to more human terms. Even the mind of a man attributed to King Nebuchadnezzar himself. So that's the picture of the lion. And then we have the bear. The bear is representative of the kingdom of Persia. We know that that was the second kingdom. The Medo-Persians, actually the Persian kingdom. The Persian army was massive. And some attribute this correlation of the bear, this vision that Daniel sees of the bear, the bulk, the size, the mass of the bear to be attributed to the massive army of Persia. And the three ribs are argued, some to say it refers to three empires conquered by the Persians and others that it merely symbolizes conquest in general. But there we again have these four kingdoms, we have Babylon and then we have Persia. Babylon represented by the lion, Persia represented by the bear. And then we have the leopard. The leopard represents the kingdom of Greece. And we know that that was the third kingdom that we saw represented in the statue. Alexander the Great's power and rule was not personified by large armies like Persia. And what do we see represented here in the vision of the leopard? Is the leopard is very, a very fast animal, right? Some would say it's the fastest animal on the planet. And then in addition to it being fast, it also had wings. Well, that is representative of the kingdom of Greece because Alexander the Great ruled in an incredible way and conquered in an incredible way. But he did it very quickly and with a much smaller army. For example, it's believed that, that he only fought with an average of about 35,000 men, where Persian, the Persian army was sometimes numbered over 2 million. Over 2 million. So you see, again, the Persian, bear, bulky, huge, Greece, leopard, fast, swift. Grecian armies were known for their speed in which they conquered, and they were accomplished some of the greatest feats of military history in a very short period of time quick time the four heads that we see there on the leopard represent four generals who were under alexander the great's rule and they were given authority under alexander how many are with me so far so then we have the fourth beast and the fourth beast is representative of the roman empire and if you'll remember in the statue that was the final empire right the one of iron and also of clay it's clearly connected to the prophecy of Daniel 2.40. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. And that's the picture that Daniel saw of this fourth beast. That is not described in a common language or in a way of that would be familiar or recognizable like the other animals. We see it with the fourth beast that there are ten horns. And how, how many remember in Daniel chapter 2 there were ten toes, right? Ten toes. 
We know that Rome ruled the world for over 700 years, from 250 BC to 407 AD. And from this kingdom, from the Roman Empire, we discussed in Daniel chapter 2, that there will arise a leader, and that's the that's the little horn that we read of here in Daniel chapter 7. So again, we have the ten horns, which scholars believe and commentators believe is going to be representative of a ten, a ten kingdom world power. And how, how ten nations, ten kingdoms, ten kings, some type of a union of sorts. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but that is what's going to happen in the future. And from, from among that, there is a, a smaller individual, a, a little horn, that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. And this will be a very real person. Church, this may be a person who is already on the planet. I don't know. Only God knows. It seems clear from this study in Daniel 2 and in Daniel chapter 7, especially Daniel chapter 7, that this person will come from the Roman Empire in terms of descent because of its identity within the fourth kingdom. But I want to be careful to say a few things to you today. So I want to be careful that we not try to get too specific here to identify and point fingers at one nation or another nation from which the Antichrist is going to arise. Because, again, if you remember, the Roman Empire ruled the world for over 700 years. And, and, and it covered the majority of the planet. So if you think about the people that were under the Roman Empire, I mean, it's, all, it's countless nations. This person, this Antichrist, will be possessed by the spirit of Satan. And will come into the world scene will be a world dictator. In John, 1 John chapter 2, the Bible refers to him as, as the Antichrist. I think sometimes when we think about this idea of someone who, who is going to be the Antichrist, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's referred to as the man of lawlessness. In Revelation 11, referred to as the beast. And this is the vision that Daniel gives us here, this glimpse in chapter 7. is I think that we can sometimes think of this Antichrist as being this, even maybe in appearance, this very evil-looking person. Right, But the reality is that the Bible tells us that, that this Antichrist is actually going to be, at least in the eyes of the world, those that are outside of the kingdom of God, to be a winner. To be a person that people esteem and, and emulate and value and even worship. He will oppose God. And he will oppose everyone who worships God and, in fact, will demand worship for himself. Makes sense, though, doesn't it? And that he's possessed by the spirit of Satan. And that was really the downfall of Satan in heaven as Lucifer that wanted to attribute to himself the worship that belonged to God. And we see that same thing here. Are you with me so far? Let's continue. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. And thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then I watched and continued to watch because of the boastful words, again, or the blasphemous words, the horn was speaking. And this is the little horn. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And the other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. That's Jesus. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days. That's God the Father. And was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. 
that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Somebody say amen. We're going to come back to that scene, but I want us to continue reading. Verse 15. And I, Daniel, was troubled in my spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. And I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. This is such an interesting aspect of this vision that Daniel is having. Because so far in the book of Daniel, Daniel is serving as an interpreter, right, for the dreams that God has given others. And now Daniel is the one that's having this dream and this vision. And we actually see that in some way he's actually participating in what he's seeing. Isn't that amazing? And so most scholars believe that Daniel is now approaching an angel. Some would even go so far to say that it could be the angel Gabriel. Because Gabriel is mentioned by name in future chapters in the book of Daniel. And so Daniel just says, oh, it looks like he knows what's going on. And he, he walks up to this angel to get some insight into what He's actually seeing. Isn't that amazing? So I approached him standing there and I asked him the meaning of all of this. And so he told me and he gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. And we've already identified what those kingdoms are. But the holy people of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, Forever and ever. One translation says of this, to the forever of forevers. That's pretty forever. Don't miss this, family. Because the thing that I want to say to you about this, and I know everybody's just looking and you're on the edge of your seat, is that this is, this is a topic and these are things that everybody gets really interested in and we should. But I don't want you to ever miss the victorious declarations that are coming from this chapter. My grandpa used to say, listen, I read the end of the book and we win, somebody. Because what the enemy wants to do is bring confusion. What the enemy wants to do is to have you hanging on details that you don't even really understand so that you're fearful. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit even now just for clarity. Clarity. To be able to see and understand clearly what God is wanting us to see in this. And the thing that I don't want you to miss, I'm going to go back to verse 17 here for a minute. Sherwin, if you can follow me there, please. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. Yes. But, <laughs> but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, to the forever of forevers. And then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying in its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. And again, we know that that is representative of the Roman Empire that Daniel had no knowledge of, right? He had no understanding of at the time of his life. These were things that were yet to come. And I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully or blasphemously. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And after them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. This is yet to come, not even in our lifetime. The fulfillment of this is still yet to come. That there will come in the future time that is designed and sovereignly ordained by God. That not even any of us would know the day or the coming of the return of Christ or these things that are yet to come. But we can keep our eye on it. We can be discerning. We can be prayerful. But we are also to remain hopeful and to remain diligent. And from this, these ten kingdoms will arise a king that at first seems insignificant or at least overlooked but will over the course of the time ordained by God. 
Don't ever forget. God is in control. God is sovereign. He is good. All of these things, even the nature and the distinction of the kingdoms that will rise up, are because of God's will and because of God's hand and what he is doing in the earth. And we can rest in that, can't we, family? We can lean into that because we know the character of our Heavenly Father, this ancient of days who will judge, and he will judge justly and righteously. In verse 25, he will speak against the Most High. He will speak blasphemies against the Most High and oppress his holy people and even try to change the set times and the laws. So we can know that about the Antichrist, that he's actually going to try to change like times and calendars and seasons that have been ordained all the way from the beginning after Noah, where God set seed time and harvest. Basically, much of the, of the, the schedule and the function in which we live today, that he's going to go so far in his arrogance to even try to change those things. There's an indicator there. Now, the holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. And some believe that that is referring to the last part of the great tribulation, which will be seven years, of which the last three and a half years is known as the great tribulation, and referring to the people of Israel. Verse 26, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. That's way better than your response. Is this on? And his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Come on, somebody. Everybody say then. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms of her, under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. And this is the end of my matter, of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled that my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Okay. So I want to go back and just recap this a little bit for us today. You with me? I want to go back to the scene of the Ancient of Days. The scene with the Ancient of Days, and again, the Ancient of Days is God the Father, is after the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ that we read about in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. I'm going to read it for you. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is the, this is the second coming of Jesus. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather immediately after the distress of those days. The distress of those days is the great tribulation. The second coming of Christ will come after the great tribulation. I'm not talking about the rapture. We're not going to get into pre, mid, or post tribulation in terms of that. Whatever your theology is about that. There's so many, again, great, the smartest people than that have ever lived, that have studied the scriptures way smarter than me, have died arguing about this. But if you want to talk about it more, you, you, you can call me. My number's listed. Please. Or you can email Pastor Teresa. She'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Because the reality is that there are scriptures, if you read through the Bible, because it, let me just, I'll just touch on it briefly, just okay. Right, because what we, what we read about is we read about a, a rapture where, where, like a thief in the night, the Lord comes and, and we are caught up to meet him in the air, right? And we, we are then with God. And, and some, some believe that that's going to happen before the tribulation, right? Pre-trib, okay? I love that. Yes, Lord. And there are scriptures that you, we could go into that we'd read that you'd say, yeah, man, that, that makes really good sense. And then there are some that believe that the, that the Lord is going to take us uh, after the times, time, and half a time, three and a half years. That would be mid-tribulation. And there are scriptures, again, what we just read here in Daniel 7, that you could say, oh, yeah, that's what it is. And there are some that believe that the second coming of Christ, where he returns with the armies of heaven and, and the kingdom of heaven and all the people of God at the end of the tribulation is that that is the rapture and the second coming of Christ that are happening simultaneously. And that would be post-trib. What we do know is that there will be tribulation. There are nations all over the world where there is already tribulation. I'm not attributing those things specifically to what we refer to as the seven years of tribulation, but we have to understand that the church has been persecuted in tribulation since the first century. 
and that God is going to be with us and for us. And the thing that I want us to keep our, our eyes on is what we call the proverbial finish line. Because we get pretty wrapped up in the here and now, and I understand that. I do too. But I want you to understand that God is good, and he is sovereign, and he is faithful. And he's going to care for his people, and he knows those who are his own. And we will reign. The kingdom will be given to us. We will reign and rule with God for all eternity. All right. Verse 30 of Matthew 24. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They will mourn because they have not received him. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heavens to the other. So after the tribulation, after the seven years of the tribulation, the last half, three and a half of that known as the great tribulation, Jesus will return. He will return with the armies of heaven and all the saints. And that is when the great battle of Armageddon will take place. And Jesus and the heavenly armies and the people of God will defeat Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, as well as the ten nations that are allied to the Antichrist. Where is that in the Bible, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Revelation chapter 19. Let's look together at verse 17. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather for the great supper of God. So that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. And then I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. Who's the rider on the horse? That is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, King of kings, and Lord of lords is written. But the beast was captured. The beast is the Antichrist. And with it, the false prophet, who will be another person on the earth at this time that will have been given powers by Satan to perform miracles. It's going to be a time. With these signs... I'm sorry, verse 20, but the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So again, after the great tribulation, we have the second coming of Christ. So we are gathered with Christ, with the armies of heaven. Are you with me, everybody? And there is going to be this great battle of Armageddon. And the angels calling for the birds, get ready to grub. Because you're going to be eating of the flesh of all of these armies that have been gathered. Because the king of kings and the lord of lords is coming. And he with the angels of heaven and the mighty people of God will defeat these armies. And will defeat the antichrist and the false prophet. And they will be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Come on. So at that time, Satan is still present, but he is now bound. This is after the battle of Armageddon. Satan is bound for a thousand years, for a millennium. How many of you have ever heard that term, millennium? And during this millennium, this thousand-year time, Jesus will reign with the saints of God on the earth. A thousand years. This is after the battle of Armageddon. This is after the great tribulation. The Antichrist comes before the great tribulation, comes into power. There's all kinds of things that are going to happen during that seven years that we'll study out. But the bottom line is that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be defeated and thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Satan will be bound for a thousand years during which time we will reign and rule with Jesus, our king, here on the earth. And I believe it will be a literal reign. I believe this language is literal and not figurative in this place. Then, after that time, Satan will be released one last time. And he will gather an immense army to fight the kingdom of God. 
But this army will be destroyed by fire from heaven. And Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet where they will be tormented day and night forever. Look with me at Revelation chapter 20. See, the Bible, the Bible reveals this to us. It's challenging. It's intense. It can be a little confusing. I'm hoping that we're getting a little bit of clarity here in what's going to happen. And again, this is the word of God that's spoken so that we would not be unaware. We don't know everything. Even with prophecy, God doesn't reveal to us everything that's ever going to happen in specific detail of our life. And truthfully, I don't want to know. Because I know me. I'll mess it up somehow. What I need to know is who, who my God is and what he calls me. And my part in this kingdom, we're going to talk about that at the end of our message today because that's really the heart of end times prophecy. If it does not affect, if end times theology does not affect our lifestyle, then we've missed it. This is not just about for us to be on the in. We have the secret code. We have the decoder ring. This is about us being empowered and compelled to be the saints of God in a world that is still lost and dying without him. Amen? Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are over, we talked about that. That's the millennial reign where Jesus and the saints of God will rule on the earth. Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. Before you get freaked out, let's keep reading. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people. The city he loves, with, which is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Again. Way better than your response. But fire came down from earth and devoured them. Oh, you don't, you don't deserve this preaching. I'm just saying right now. <laughs> you know I'm playing with you. I love you. Verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever. For the forever of forevers. So, Satan is released. He had been bound for a thousand years during which we will rule and reign with Christ here on the earth. He gathers this immense army that comes to battle against the city of God, Jerusalem. But before the battle even takes place, fire from heaven comes and destroys him. And all these armies that have been gathered and Satan with the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, eternally separate from God. At this time is, as well, family, the judgment of unbelievers, what we refer to as the white throne of judgment that will occur at this time. And so for those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, hear this, please. Look at me, everyone. For those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will join Satan and the beast and the Antichrist and all of hell eternally separate from God. Revelation 20, 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened and which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the final judgment. This is, this is not a story. It's not just a story. This is not Lord of the Rings. This is real. This is real. And from this time, 
after this great judgment, we will enter into the internal kingdom of God. And a new heaven and a new earth will come. And we will enjoy the presence of God for all eternity. That's a long time. Verse 1 of Revelation 21. Then I saw, this is after this, after the great judgment. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. We just read that, didn't we? We just read it. It said the earth and the heavens were fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. This is our future. Nothing can change this. Family, I want you to see something as we close this morning. In the end of all of this, in the end of all days, in God's perfect sovereignty in which the way that it it occurs, Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, is presented to his father. That's what we saw there where the ancient of days took his seat on a throne of fire and 10,000 times 10,000 were attending him. That is the ancient of days. And Jesus is brought in before him and is given all authority and glory and power. That is the return of the king. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And because of God's great love for you and me, we will reign with him and dwell with him for all eternity. How many are thankful for what's going to happen? Come on, somebody. Listen, I love the word of God, and I love studying all the way this through. And listen, read, read Revelation 21 and 22 again today. Just get yourself happy in Jesus. But the bottom line is I am way more excited about what happens after Revelation 22. Because we can't even fathom it. And not because we're good, but because he is good, and he is gracious, and he is merciful. And because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the debt for my sin and yours. That is why we are in this story this way. Daniel saw the coronation of the Messiah King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Family, my prayer for us is that God would stir something today in our hearts. Whereas never before, we would want every person that we know or will ever know to spend eternity with God and not apart from him. It's not enough for us to be thankful that we're in. Everybody look at me. It's not enough to be thankful that we're in. We do not exist for ourselves. The church exists for the sake of the world. I love what our, our Foursquare found, founder, Amy Semple McPherson, who's the one that founded the denomination of churches that we are a part of, 100,000 churches around the world. And next year, uh, in 2023, we'll celebrate our, our, our 100 year, our centennial anniversary. This is what she wrote. We're all the same. I mean, we all have a heart. We all have tears. We all have sins. We all need a savior. We all need the blood. And every one of us can work for Jesus. Whether we go across the ocean or whether we stay at home, this is our task. I love this. Lord, make us soul winners. Every one of us. No one knows but God the Father the day or the hour of Jesus' return. The Bible says he'll come like a thief in the night. And so we must stay ready so we don't have to get ready. How many are thankful today for the blood of Jesus that washed you white as snow and because of his sacrifice on the cross that your name is written in that Lamb's book of life? How many are thankful when the books, books are open, your name is in the book? 
But I'm going to tell you something, family. Beyond our applause, beyond our shouts or our hallelujah, our greatest expression of gratitude for God, for all that he has done for us, is that we would walk in the footsteps of his son, Jesus Christ, who was sacrificial with his life so that the whole gospel would go into the whole world. That whoever would believe upon him would be saved and would not spend eternity separate from God. We have a part to play in this. We are on commission with Jesus. And I want to tell you, this week I told Pastor Teresa this during our team meeting on Wednesday. That I was, as I was preparing this message and studying through this and wanting hopefully to bring some clarity and not confusion to your hearts today. That the Lord gave me a vision that these altars were packed with people on their knees coming to Christ for the first time. But I can't do that by myself. It's going to take all of us catching the burden for the lost. Seeing all of this and not just going, whew, I'm in. But instead going on the highways and the byways and the trails and the places that nobody wants to go. The places where you are already working and living and loving and playing. And that the power of this message would compel us to bring people in. How many want to see these altars full? Hundreds of people that are coming to Christ. You remember that picture that we read about here in Daniel 7 of the throne of God? Do you remember that? And the, the Ancient of Days took his seat on the throne. Do you remember what was, what was flowing from that throne? Anybody? It was fire. It's because God is the great judge and it represents the judgment that was about to happen. But I want to say to you, after all things are said and done, after the arise of these kingdoms and the Antichrist and the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, the second coming, the thousand year reign with Jesus, the new heaven and the new earth will come and we will live forever and ever with God. And listen to what the throne of God will look like then. Revelation 22 verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city and on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The river of life. Crystal clear. Every right made wrong. For the ancient of days has judged. Are you thankful today? Can you just close your eyes? And if you want to, even just to raise your hands. Come on, let's just lift a praise. Let's let some worship in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Come on, tell them, family, we love you. We're so grateful for you, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your victory over death, hell, and the grave. Thank you for your grace and mercy over our lives, Lord. Not by our works that anyone would boast, but by faith through grace through faith, Lord, in you. Thank you, Jesus, for these things that are yet to come. And God, would you stir the hearts of your people to go into the highways and byways. Lord, make us soul winners, every one of us. Make us soul winners, every one of us, for your glory. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Enjoy your time at Table Talk, family. We'll pull you back in a little bit.